Well, welcome to TFHOC, wherever you are joining us from. We are so glad that you're with us. Hey, we want to invite you to worship with us. Go ahead and get to your feet. Let's sing together. Come on. you fight for me so what was meant for evil won't end in my defeat if what I'm walking through doesn't look like victory I'm ready for the battle I'm ready for the fight come on the time for fear of the enemy is over the time for faith team I'm just I feel ready to go in this moment and hey welcome to the father's house we're glad you're here wherever you're watching from in whatever state that might be in your living room pajamas whatever that looks like we are glad you're here and today is Mother's Day so happy Mother's Day and man you know uh, I know my mom's watching happy Mother's Day and when I just just take the time today just to especially uh, moms that are single moms stepmoms moms with young kids you know like uh, they're all homeschooling now and just man they need extra love today and so make sure that you just give that extra love to your mom today and you know as a church and a community as as uh, all of this started happening with quarantine and 
we always we were just honored to be the hands and feet of Jesus that was our goal is that we just want to love our community well and we said hey what if we could feed a hundred thousand meals during this season and we just had this huge goal and I'm, I just I'm so excited to announce that last week we were able to feed over a hundred thousand meals in Southern California man God is good and, and here's the thing it's, it's because of your generosity, it's because of your investment into the Father's house that we get to be the hands and feet. And here's the great thing, is that we're not done. We're not done. We're going to continue in the coming weeks to go out and bring more food and more meals and whatever resources people need because here's what, that's what the church does. And it's because your investment that we get to do that. And so I just want to pray right now as we, we uh, continue to worship. Um, and we get to give back to God what He has so graciously given to us. And, and if you're new to the Father's house, this isn't for you. But if this is your tribe, this is you've been kind of watching and hanging out, wherever you might be, uh, we want to encourage you that giving is about worship. We get to give back to God because of what He's done to us. It's not about a, a dollar amount. It's about aligning our heart to what God is doing in our life. And so you can do that a couple ways. You can go to the website. You can text 77977. You can give on the app. But we just want to pray over that uh, offering right now. And then we want to continue to worship uh, right now. Lord, we just thank you again that we get to be your hands and feet. Lord, we thank you what you are doing. We thank you for the opportunity to be a voice. We thank you for the opportunity to love people all across uh, the country, Lord. And so we thank you for what you've done and sending your son for us, Lord. We thank you, and we are just believing that you're gonna multiply and multiply and multiply so that we can bless and bless and bless, that we are blessed to be a blessing. We thank you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
sing that together. I just want you. I just want you and nothing else. And nothing else. And nothing else will do. Nothing else, nothing else will do. Come on, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing. This is your invitation. As always, we don't want these lyrics to simply be a song to kill time. This is our mode of worship. So right where you are, will you join us? Will you stand to your feet to honor God, to honor God with your voice, to honor God with your worship? And then here's the challenge. Will you sing these words as a declaration, as an anthem over your soul? Will you sing these words and allow them to pierce your heart in a way that you nothing believe it, that there is nothing do. else in this I world that can satisfy or satiate you. what you need. So come on, church. Nothing Will you stand to your feet? Will you stand to your feet and nothing join us in worshiping God, for He is worthy to be praised. God, we invite you into this space, online and in person. You are worthy, God. You are worthy of our praise. Nothing else. Nothing else. I didn't teach last week, Pastor Matt taught, and I got to digitally connect with friends from New Jersey to New Mexico to New England, and also, come, come on for this one, Newcastle. Come on, Jesus. So hey, we believe that God is doing something new. Uh, if you are with your family, will you say hello to them, high five them? Uh, maybe you are in the chat box. We wanna know where you are from. You could wave at someone, say hi to someone as we go ahead and get today started. But listen, wherever you are at, we want to give a special shout out to two groups. Uh, of course, our second campus, which is the Norco Prison Campus. To the men there, we love you, we pray for you, we are thinking of you often and cannot wait to be back with you in person. And, and secondly, hey, it's Mother's Day. I think we need to have a huge shout out for the, uh, the moms that are watching online and for those that are in here that are not hollering for your mama. I mean, shame on you. Come on, show your mama some love. But um, if we are in a new series called Battle Ready. We're actually three weeks in to the series Battle Ready. And given the holiday and given just where we are at and who we are celebrating, I've entitled this message, if you're a note taker, I've entitled this message, Fight Like a Mother. Okay, that is the goal that I want you to hold on to. And here's the thing, we are all fighting for freedom. Here at TFHOC, the reason why Battle Ready was put together is because we are fighting for freedom and we wanna teach you how. This is how you become battle ready. Now, before we dive into the message, if you are uh, joining us for the very first time, here's a little bit of a synopsis. Here's a little bit of a recap, a little bit of some history of what we've been going through. But what we've been going through is part of the freedom process. Here's the thing, there is a battle and we must be battle ready. There is an enemy that has come to steal, kill and destroy and we will get to that in a second, but we must be on guard to fight. And the message that I'm bringing today, maybe you're thinking like, well, that really doesn't pertain to me. It's not gonna change my life. Listen, listen, when you understand that we are in a spiritual battle, no longer will we be victims to life circumstances. 
I firmly believe that we will become victorious. We will become more than conquerors in Christ, no longer victims, but we will become victorious against the kingdom of darkness. Now, when we talk about spiritual warfare, kingdom of darkness, demons and devils and Satan, I remember as a kid, I was like, that is so scary. I want nothing to do with that. And every time that people would talk about these things, especially when I was little, I'd be like, la, 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 la. I don't wanna hear it. It doesn't pertain to me. But then as I got to get older, I realized by witnessing Christians strong in their faith, overcoming temptations, getting over addictions and sin, setting free of strongholds. And I realized they knew something about spiritual warfare. And when I began a deep dive of understanding not just spiritual warfare, but this series, Battle Ready, I awakened to the fact and the truth of why didn't anyone talk about this earlier? Why didn't anyone spend time and unpack the, 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 the kingdom of darkness and the assault on our faith, the assault on our life? And so I am praying and believing in the name of Jesus as he floods wherever you are at, your car, your cubicle, your office, wherever you are at, wherever you are watching, that today the spirit of God so penetrates your heart that you are awakened to the fact that there is a battle. Now, if you've been with us, you will know that this series looks at the Apostle Paul, he wrote a letter to a region, a, a city called Ephesus. And the book is entitled Ephesians. So in this series, we've gone through Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Now, we're encouraging our church, read chapters 4, 5, and 6. Read them 4, 5, and 6. Read 4, 5, and 6 so that when we come together to learn, we just deep dive into a couple scriptures and we have an understanding of what Paul has been talking about. So on week one, uh, I kicked off the series reminding us that we are going to battle and we need to step up like warriors. And then last week, Pastor Matt taught about this thing called strongholds. And he would help us identify the battle that's going on in our mind. How do we take authority of the battle of our mind? Now, if you were here and if you weren't, you can go back and watch his message from last week, but he gave us four ways to overcome a stronghold. The first one he listed was identify it. Identify your stronghold. Well, today, get ready because we're gonna take this one concept of identifying a stronghold and going deep with it. I firmly believe that this is going to set people free. If, if you do the work, if you're willing to go to some of the most broken and painful parts of your heart, I believe that you will be able to experience freedom and that's what we're going after for Battle Ready. Now, in identifying the enemy's tactics, his moves to get you. It's gonna be an, an assault on your spiritual freedom. And today, what I want to identify is the lies that hold us down, the lies that keep us bound from inheriting what is rightfully ours. See, uh, I want you to grab your notebooks, your Bibles, and your pens because today we're gonna have a little bit of a teach. All right, I hope you came prepared because today is gonna be a teach. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five. So last week we were in Ephesians chapter four. This week we're in Ephesians chapter five. And as you grab your Bible and flip to Ephesians chapter five, I am gonna be reading Genesis chapter three. We're gonna go back to celebrate one of our early faith mothers, of the faith and her name is Eve. And there's this conversation that Eve has with Satan, the serpent, who has been deceiving us from the beginning of time. Now, we pick this up in Genesis chapter three, verse one, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the, eye, to the woman, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. From the beginning of the Bible, to the beginning of time, the enemy has been sent to deceive. The enemy has tried deceiving us. Why? Because he wants to leave us naked and afraid like he did Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He has been lying and deceiving and conniving like some dirty ex-boyfriend that you can't get away from. That is like the enemy. And that's a word for some of y'all right now. This is a little freezy on Mother's Day. If you have some dirty ex-boyfriend that's trying to holler at you, it's time to let them go. He is a serpent from the pit of hell. Amen. Now, the enemy lied and deceived Adam and Eve. And the hope for today 
whether you are married or single, whether you are young or old, whether you are male or female, is that we get to learn from the mother of our faith and learn how to fight like a mother, okay? For stepmoms like Sarah in the Bible, like adoptive moms like the princess of Egypt, hey, for pseudo moms like Naomi in the book of Ruth, for barren moms like Hannah, for fertile moms like Leah, for holy moms like Mary, and for some hood ratchet moms like Rahab, my hope is that we rise and we honor our moms on this day while also honoring the mother of our faith and the mothers of our faith. So you should be in Ephesians chapter five and this is where we pick up. Paul is writing to his friends and he says this, for you were once darkness, you were darkness, and now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. I have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And this is what Matt had said last week. Hey, take off and put on. Take off the deeds of darkness. Put on the deeds of righteousness. Jump down to verse 13. But everything exposed by light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. Now, whether we want to or not, we find ourselves in warfare between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. Now, this might feel a little bit much, but I need you to hold on because if we want freedom for our lives, if we want freedom from the battle of our minds, we have to be aware of what's going on. Now, when we speak about kingdoms of darkness, uh, some circles refer to it as like spiritual warfare. This all feels very theoretical. Now, according to statistics, if I were to ask Americans, do you believe in God, in a God? 92% of Americans will say yes. But then if you ask the same group of, of, of Americans, do you believe in Satan? Almost 70% of them will say no. Why is that? Ever since the historical enlightenment period, humans have separated the supernatural from the natural. According to the enlightened thinkers of that time, there was natural causes. There was scientific explanation for what we would consider evil. And according to a research that came out of the New York Times, an article that was speaking about God and Satan and good and evil, what they said is that Westerners like to believe in supernatural good, like God and angels, but do not wanna believe in supernatural bad, like the devil and demons. So before we continue on in this series, I just have to ask you a very real question. Do you believe in evil? And I'm not just talking about you said a bad word or you had an evil thought or you'd really like to kill that person. I'm talking about straight up. Do you believe that we are at warfare between a kingdom of darkness? Do you believe that there is a kingdom of darkness that opposes you, opposes your marriage, opposes your children, opposes the call of God upon your life? We have said this verse repeatedly in week one and week two. I'm gonna say it again. And if you're sitting here like, I already know John 10, 10. Great, that means we've done our job. Scripture says that the thief, Satan, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, what? The enemy, Satan, the thief, has come to kill the experiencing of a good God. The enemy has come to destroy experiencing the goodness of God. The enemy has come to kill experiencing the goodness of God. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite dead guys, he says this about Christians in battle. He says, to be a Christian is to be a warrior. The soldier of Jesus Christ must not expect to find ease in the world. It is a battlefield and his occupation is war. Woo. Listen up, warrior, it's time to fight. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 11. Have nothing to do, nothing, zero, zilch, nada. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So over the next two weeks of this series, we wanna expose evil and the kingdom of darkness and the tactics of the enemy that keep us bound. Last week, we discussed strongholds. Today, we're gonna to be unpacking lies, accusations. So here's a little bit of context. In Revelation 12, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 12, we are actually told the descriptors of Satan. In Revelation 12, it says that, that Satan is a deceiver and an accuser. And we see this in the beginning of the book of the Bible. Genesis is the last, and we just, or Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and Revelation is the last, and we see in the book of Revelation, Satan lied to Eve, and he hasn't stopped lying to humanity up until now. 
Men and women of God, I need you to hear me. I need you to write this down. I need you to holler in the chat box. The devil is a liar. And not just because it sounds cool to say, oh, the devil is a liar. No, what you need to know is the devil is a liar. He's an accuser. He's a deceiver. He wants to throw you off your game. You've got to recognize how he's going to come at you or else you'll be taken down in the throw of life. Now, to understand or to, to, to wrap our minds around, we could easily understand deceiver. Most of us realize that to deceive is to lie. So we know that the, the enemy is a liar. But this word accuse is interesting. Now, if you're sitting here thinking like, well, how can you just say the devil's a liar? Like, back it up. I'm glad that you're sitting there sanctimoniously and pharisaically questioning my theology. I want you, don't, don't, don't turn there because we have put the scripture on the screen. But in John 8, 44, it says this. Jesus says to the evil one, the evil one's a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. He's talking about Satan. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the father of lies. There is a battle for our heart. There is a battle for our mind. There is a battle for our soul. And the enemy wants to use strongholds to hold us down and to make, it, make us captive so that we don't walk into the fullness of our calling. And we need to be woke. We need to realize, no, there, 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 there's, a, there's an enemy. I'm a child of God. And as he deceived Adam and Eve, I don't want to be that dumb. I want to realize that the enemy is a liar. The enemy wants to accuse you. And then after he's accused you, he wants you to agree with that accusation. He wants you to believe the lie that he's told you. The father of lies will accuse you of sin. The enemy will come and say these things about you. Sometimes they're true. Sometimes they're not true. He's talking about some sinfulness. Again, could be true, it could be untrue. This is as a warrior of God, you are gonna have to use your discernment because the enemy's gonna come at you and say, you lied to your boss, you cheated on your taxes, you cheated on your spouse, again, you got drunk, again, you hit the pipe, again, you rolled, again. No, you slept with that person's uh, wife, again, you cheated, you stole from her mom, again, hey, those are sins, and they grieve God. They, grieve, they definitely grieve God. But there are two things that I want you to know. One, sin is wrong. Sin grieves God. But this is what I want you to write down. The accusations of the enemy against, that the enemy has brought against you have no power to condemn because Jesus nailed those claims to the cross. See, the enemy comes to accuse you and you are, oh, you're this and you're that and you're this and you will never and you can't, but you need to stop the voice of the enemy and you fight it with scripture. Look at what Paul says in Colossians 2. He says, you were dead as in past tense, brother and sister. See, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. This is, look, at, he continues on. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave you of your sins. He canceled the record of your charges against us and took it away by nailing it to a cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. That's devil and demons. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Paul says, because of Calvary, because of the cross, you are innocent. You are innocent. The enemy's lies cannot stop you. See, Satan is not your judge. He's your accuser. Evil is not your judge. It is your accuser. And the enemy wants to come in and hold shame and sin as a weight of yoke, a bondage around us, making us feel like we have to be quiet, live in silence and in darkness. But child of light, flick on the light. Reveal what the enemy is doing. You are no chump. See, evil works and will shame you by accusing you of something ugly, by accusing you of some frailty, some weakness, maybe even some sin. Dr. Dan Allender, out of the Allender Center for Psychology and Theology up in Seattle, to which I'm in debt for a lot of the research that we put together for this series. He says something interesting. He says that uh, in our story, there is a sense of fittedness. There's a sense of fittedness to the accusations of the enemy. In other words, the, tactness, uh, the tactics of the enemy, the tactics of evil have been strategic, they've been long, and they've been concerted since you were a child. So how do the accusations of today mess with you? How do the lies of the enemy wreak havoc 
When do those accusations first begin? I firmly believe that if we don't stop and recognize the accusations, we won't be able to wrestle against the tactics of the enemy. So here are the accusations that have assaulted me in the past. You are fat and fat is ugly. You will always be fat, so you will always be ugly. The church will never be able to accept you in the fullness of who you are. Now, I have spent several months working on where the enemy has come in and felt resonance in my heart. I've spent a couple weeks even going through this series of identifying the strongholds and learning to break them in the name of Jesus. Because I am a chosen child of God and I cannot lead people where I have not gone. Let me tell you, uh, my favorite Bible teacher, uh, she says to teach where you're living, otherwise your words will be dead. So let me share very vulnerably where these accusations started. And there's multiple, but I just pick three. I was 11 years old. It was midweek Bible study on a Wednesday night at Montebello Intermediate High School. And I remember leaving after the Bible study and we played kickball in the courtyard. The 10 and 10 through 12 year olds played kickball. And there was this one boy I was absolutely in love with. I was obese at the time and didn't realize it. I figured if I could kick a really good uh, ball and score a home run, he'll pay attention to me. So that day he was a pitcher and he rolled the ball. I kicked the ball, sailed over his head. And with such pride as I'm turning first base, heading towards second, I see him out of the corner of my eye doing one of these things saying, whoa, Bianca's running. She's so fat. She's causing an earthquake. If I push her down, she'll cause a black hole. By second base, I realized, one, I am fat and there is shame. And two, church cannot handle me. At the age of 12 years old, my sister and I were at church again. Do you see where the enemy is coming in? Church and wait, church and wait. By the age of 12 years old, my sister and I were messing around with some kids at church and there was this one boy, Michael, who would always make fun of my twin sister and I because of our weight. Well, he started messing with Jasmine. <laughs> Jasmine is no chunk, she chump, she pushed back and Michael fell back and broke his arm. Surrounded by a group of adults all looking at us, I remember staring at them, shaming Jasmine for, pe- for picking on a boy much skinnier than her. And I remember that day seared in my mind that my weight is a threat to people at church. The enemy has tried weaving in church, the place where God has called me to, and marring my identity to keep me out of the calling that he's purposed me to. And it didn't stop when I was a kid. I can go on year after year, but let me just speak about a recent one. Not even three years ago, I'm speaking at a conference, one of the largest conferences I have ever spoken at in my life. I mean, the speakers there, if I were to say their names, you'd actually know them. I am nervous and I am, I'm believing like I'm, I'm walking in the calling and the fullness that God has called me to. I'm about to walk into the auditorium and out of nowhere, I see a woman bum rush up to me with a brown paper bag and she thrust this bag in my hands and said, I lost 30 pounds doing these magic pills and I wanted to give them to you. I was about to preach the word of God and what she handed me reinforced the lie of the enemy. I am fat and fat is ugly. I will always be fat, so I will always be ugly. The church will never be able to handle me. Do I think that this woman was intentionally trying to mar my identity? No. But see, the enemy will use words to attach to wounds and make us bound. Be woke, church, be woke. So those are my accusations. Do you see how my accusations weaved into the broken parts of my heart? And that's just like the enemy. He's looking for moments of pain of your broken heart to slither right in and whisper lies over you. And I'm sharing these embarrassing moments because I believe that we are a church where we give permission to go second. That if we are not honest, and if we don't have the courage to be honest, Will we expect it of anyone else? In your community groups this week, would you be this honest? Because if you are not willing to shed light in the dark areas of your life, you will never experience the fullness and freedom that Christ has promised us. So those are my accusations. I'm gonna ask you a pointed question. I'm gonna let it hang in the air. What are your accusations? Maybe it might be too much this early in this time zone, of this day, with screaming kids. So let me fill in some blanks. Let me give you some possible accusations. You are so incompetent. You never work hard enough. You're just like your father. You are a liar. 
You are dangerous to yourself and to everyone else. You're a horrible mom. You will always be obese. You're a drunk. You're a failure. You're a fraud. Now ask yourself this simple question. How old are those accusations? And when did they begin? Because you inevitably can root it back to a trauma, to a pain, to something that's hurt. Now remember what we just read in Ephesians 5.13, but everything exposed by light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So let's turn on the light. So this is where we gotta do some work, hang with me. The tricky part of accusations is that there's always a grain of truth. You're gonna believe like, wow, yeah, 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 that is true. So it's hard to differentiate between guilt and condemnation. So, so let's just highlight a few things because my fear is that you're hearing this and saying, well, then there's nothing wrong with my sin. No, scripture is very clear about sin. Getting drunk is a sin. Lying is a sin. Shacking up pre-marriage is a sin. And some of y'all are like, you can't have sex before marriage. No, go look at the talk on YouTube. You'll get more information. Now, all of those things are sin. Yes, and they grieve God. Yes, but you need to learn and recognize whose voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of God? Or are you listening to the voice of Satan? Now, in psychological language, I love psychobabble. I, I, I've studied therapy and psychology and it fascinates me. And I read that when they talk to clients and therapists are doing therapy with clients, they're like, are you listening to your inner critic or your inner advocate? They are so close to the truth. Let's talk instead of psychobabble, let's talk some biblical babble, okay? Because in scripture, uh, Revelation tells us that Satan is an accuser. Are you listening to the voice of the accuser? Or are you listening to the voice that, John, that Jesus tells us in John 14, the voice of the advocate? The spirit of God is alive in you. See, the enemy wants to whisper falsities. The enemy wants to whisper lies, but the Holy Spirit is within you and is speaking truth over you. I, I love this beautiful example. That I wanna back this up and have a deep understanding of this. There's this example out of John chapter four. Jesus has his conversation. It's kind of a sketchy conversation. Jesus has his conversation with a woman at noon at a well in Samaria. Now, uh, he says something confrontational to her and talking about her whole tendencies, okay? Now, uh, he was very loving about it, but he made no, he didn't, don't get it twisted. He came for her. He read her mail. He was on her doorstep. He was spitting some truth. And this is what he says. He said, hey, go call your husband and have him come back here. And she said, oh, sir, I, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right to say that you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five and the one that you have now, he's not even your husband. That same dialogue, that same conversation could be read in two different ways, two different tones. One of confrontation and condemnation and consternation and guilt and judgment or one with fierce kindness. How do we know which one? and which tone and what body language that was here. Jesus offered this woman uh, such amazing kindness that she went back to her city. She went back to her city and she told all her neighbors, she told her friends, let me tell you about a man who read my business. Let me tell you about a man who called me out on my crap. How do we know that she felt no shame? Because she went home and told everyone. And guess what? Shame makes us do the opposite. Shame causes us to hide in the Garden of Eden like Adam and Eve. This woman was bold about this transformation. And I wanna be set free from shame and accusations. I want you to be set free from shame and accusations. And so I wanna walk us through an assignment very quickly. Uh, Dr. Adam Young uh, gave me this assignment and I'm giving it to you. I want you to pull out a, a notebook or a piece of paper that you will have for the week. And every time that you hear an accusation, I want you to write down the accusation. And every time that you hear the accusation repeated, make a little tally mark by it. And every time that you hear maybe a different accusation, maybe for some of us it's multiple accusations, keep a tally mark by every time you hear that accusation. At the end of the week, I want you to look at that piece of paper and see how many tally marks are there. And then ask yourself this question. How long have the words that I just wrote down been at play in my life? When did those words first come alive in my story? For my weight and my shame, I had over 75 tally marks a week. And that's one accusation. 
the accusations that we suffer from today, there is a fittedness to our story. And until you become aware of these accusations, you might just think it's a truth about you. You might just think, well, it is what it is. But you need to recognize, brother, sister, you need to recognize that evil has a voice. Evil has a voice and it is whispering falsities. It is whispering accusations over you. Now, how do you know if this is accusation or if this is conviction? Well, what's conviction? Maybe someone there is like, I don't get all this Christian-y language. Conviction is when the Spirit of God tells you, whispers to your heart, hey, what you're doing ain't cool. I got something better for you. Put the cookies down because I got a seven-course meal for you. That's conviction. So I want us to make sure, let's go a little bit deeper with this. When the Lord is convicting you of a sin, you made a mistake, that's a sin. When the Lord is convicting you of sin, it feels like love and gentility and kindness and compassion. And it feels, if we could visualize this, like the prodigal father running after the prodigal son, chasing him down, saying, welcome home. If it is condemnation, it is gonna feel heavy and sad and the tonality is gonna be weighted down. It's gonna feel like dark and ominous. And here is how you can separate the different narratives. If it's conviction, you're gonna have an awareness Oh gosh, I need to change. If it is condemnation, you're gonna say, I'm a failure and this will never change. Conviction, condemnation. And you have to be careful because evil is deceptive. Evil is cunning. And, 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 and your sin, though it's wrong, the enemy wants to come in and make you feel that your sin will separate you from God. There is no hope for you and you can never change. So let's play this out. I wanna make sure that you know how to identify this. Let me give us a hypothetical situation. Say you were a 14-year-old boy and you grew up dirt poor. Or maybe let's pull this out a little bit more. Let's say that you're a 14-year-old boy and you grew up not recognized by anyone. Maybe you were overlooked. People at school made fun of you. Maybe they didn't know your name. They ostracized you. They didn't include you. And they said things like, who is that person? What a loser. They will never become anything at all. What seated in your mind at that age was that it was not safe to be you. The enemy is cunning. Be woke to this. You took that accusation that you will never amount to anything, that no one will ever care, and you made a vow with the enemy saying, it is not okay to be me. That vow with the kingdom of darkness allowed you to believe that you are weak, that you are feeble, that you are ineffectual, and nobody cares about you. The enemy will use word wounds to wreak havoc on us and to combat what those people said. And those people, listen, listen, it could be your mom, it could be your dad, it could be your neighbor, it could be friends, it could be cousins, it could be friends, it could be enemies. That they will use word wounds. They will use these wounds to go and break your heart and the enemy will come in and echo those words from now until eternity. You're a loser, you're worth nothing, you will amount to nothing. So you build your life on lies and pride, which by the way are sin, creating a false narrative of who you are. I've got to pretend to be someone that I'm not or, or people won't love me. You begin to spend money and buy clothes and, do, and buy status, creating the illusion, the false sense that you are a person of influence, that people should care about you. You hustle and you grind to size the illusion to be who you think people want you to be. And you believe the lie that you are insignificant and unworthy. Maybe in the stronghold assessment that you did last week, you, it was revealed that there is a stronghold of pride and insecurity and a feeling of not being worthy. Here's my fear. We did the stronghold assessment that Pastor Matt gave us and it's just like, yep, got a stronghold of pride and insecurity. And we pray some feeble anemic prayer and slap a verse on it like rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the blood. God, break that stronghold. I'm telling you, it doesn't work like that. We need to manhandle and take authority of the accuser. We need to tell him, not anymore. I recognize your tactics and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Through the shed blood of my savior, Jesus, I get to come at you, enemy. See, I'm not going to Jesus and say, take this stronghold away. No, 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 Jesus already defeated Satan. Now it's my turn. I get to tell the enemy, you will come at me with accusations and I am going to bring them down. No 
longer are you going to choke me out. No longer are you going to have authority over me. I'm a free child of God. If you don't know this, let me tell you, I am anointed to tear down strongholds. My voice is a prophetic declaration over people around the globe, letting them know that they are free. Wake up. You are not blind. You are not dead. Rise up because the spirit of God is in you, blocking the accuser from the lies of the enemy. This is how we break strongholds. We recognize the stronghold. We identify the lie and we come after the enemy. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. Pastor Matt read this over us last week. We use God's mighty weapons, not as worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments. What is that, fam? That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and make them obey Christ. The words of the enemy need to obey Christ. I'm a chosen child of the Most High King. No matter what the enemy tells you, mighty warrior, this is what you need to hear today. That, that you are not a mistake. That you are not a bad decision. That you are not a poor choice. That you are not a, your dress size. You are not a scale number. You are not your hidden sin. You are not your addiction. You are not your lust. You are not your anger. You are not your layoff notice. You are not your social media number. No, you are a child of God. You're a miracle in the waiting. You are a story of grace poured out. You are a magnet of blessing. You are a child of God. You are success in hibernation. You are one step towards greatness. You are one decision away from freedom. You are one decision away from liberty. And the only thing separating you from what you're not, from what you are, is recognizing that the stronghold of the enemy is nothing but a lie. Renouncing it in the name of Jesus and declaring, I know who my God is. I know my identity and I rebuke the lies of the enemy. Right here. I believe that the words that the band are gonna sing over us, Tay, will you worship? Because here's the thing, when we come to God, there is no shame, there's no embarrassment. Maybe the broken parts of your heart feel embarrassed. Maybe the, the sexual abuse that put an identity on you of shame that made you feel like you had to live your life in secret. Maybe the financial stress that you're hiding with the illusion of perfection and this perfect image brings a sense of embarrassment or shame. Maybe the lies that the enemy has put over you that you will never be able to tell the truth because if you tell the truth then people won't like you. Are you ready to identify the lie? Here's the greatest sense of freedom that we could have. The greatest lie that the enemy told you is that you cannot receive salvation, that you are unworthy of a relationship with Jesus. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Right now, right where you are, wherever you're watching from, whatever time zone, whatever day, whatever nation, whatever language, guess what? You can enter into salvation. You, today, my brother and sister, you can receive the gift of salvation. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna renounce the stronghold of doubt and skepticism and lies, and we're gonna replace it with faith and belief. So right where you are, whoever you are, maybe you've never heard about this man named Jesus. Maybe you've never heard about a kingdom of darkness. Today we get to shed a light on the fact that you are loved, that you are chosen, that God sees you. Maybe, maybe you're the other side. Maybe you used to walk with the Lord and you've walked away. Now is your opportunity to come back to God. There is no stronghold, there is no lie that the enemy can hang on you. There is no sin that will separate you. Now is the time to get back in right relationship with God. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna count to three and wherever you are, you're gonna raise your hand declaring that Jesus is your savior. I'm gonna wrap some, some understanding around this so you recognize the decision that you're making. One, by raising your hands, you are saying, Jesus Christ is the Lord and savior of my life. Two, I believe that Jesus can forgive me of my sins because he resurrected from the grave. And three, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave can live in me. If that's you and you are ready to make that decision, one, 
two, three. Will you raise your hand? I'm believing in faith that there's hands going up. If you're in the chat box and you said yes to Jesus, hey, give us a hand emoji. If, if, if you wanna take your next step on the fold below, we have a way for you to say, I said yes to Jesus. Text number, click the link. We wanna put resources in your hands. But saints around the globe, I want us to pray a prayer of declaration. Can we all say this? Can we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, and cleanse my conscience. Today I choose you. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Hey church, can we celebrate what God has done? Right where you are, will you stand to your feet? Will you give God the praise that he is due? Guess what? We are free. There's no stronghold that can keep you down. What a savior. There's no sin to separate you. What a savior. There is no sickness that God cannot heal. What a savior. Because he is a good savior, can we sing to him? We stand to your feet and give him honor. You are free. You are free. You are free in the name of Jesus. And you need to know that whatever you're facing right now, whatever you're dealing with right now, you have victory because of what Jesus did. Man, what a great message today. We hope you enjoyed it. I just want to give you a couple next steps as you're uh, sitting there. Uh, there's some links in the in the box there. And you, if you said yes to Jesus, go ahead and just click on that link. And as Pastor Bianca said, hey, we want to walk with you in this journey. We want to get you resources. We want to get you connected so that you can take your next step. And here's the thing is if you need prayer for any reason, if you have anything going on that you need prayer for, we have a team of people that they would love to pray with you. They would love to connect with you and just pray with you, stand with you, pray for you, uh, whatever's happening. And if you are interested in the Father's house, Orange County, and you want to be a part of what we're doing here, there's a next steps, and you can get into groups, you can get into volunteer digitally. Uh, we want you to be part of the family. Hey, thank you for watching. We'll see you guys next week.